Section 4 Detection of Financial Reporting Quality Issues What we have seen so far in this reading and also based on what we have seen in other readings in financial reporting and analysis we recognize that companies have choices in how they present information companies also have choices in how financial results are calculated the choice with regards to how information is presented results in financial reporting quality if information is presented well it properly reflects the underlying economic situation then the financial reporting quality is high otherwise it is low how financial results are calculated generally this refers to earnings quality if earnings are high and sustainable then we say that earnings quality is good as a high level remark choices in presentation this is related to financial reporting quality these choices are transparent what that means is that relatively speaking it is easy for us to determine whether the information is being presented well or not on the other hand choices in the calculation of financial results are more difficult to detect there are several ways to increase performance and financial position in the current period and these are listed over here one is to recognize revenue prematurely let's say a software services company sells its product and services the services have not fully been delivered yet but the revenue is recognized so that would be premature recognition it would make revenue and hence earnings look higher in the current period use non recurring transactions to increase profits a company might sell its accounts receivable so that creates a one off unsustainable increase in revenue and earnings defer expenses to later periods so the warranty expense that should be recognized in the current period because the sales happened in this period are not being recognized enough measure and report assets at higher values or a company might report liabilities at a lower value than is appropriate the combination of these two will result in equity being overstated ways to increase performance and financial position in a later period defer income to a later period there might be times where in a given period the income is good the company potentially believes that earnings in the next period will not be so good so what the company might do is defer some of the income to the next period recognize future expenses in a current period setting the table for improving future performance we talked about the cookie reserve accounting example and there we talked about sunbeam so there might be situations where in a given period the expenses recognized are higher than what should be which makes the expenses in the next period lower than what they should be and hence earnings might be and hence earnings would be overstated in the next period let's now look at presentation choices in a little more detail the curriculum points out that companies may use strange new metrics that are not mentioned in any accounting standards and especially in the 1990s and the 2000s with several internet companies taking off during the 90s there were metrics such as eyeballs these metrics were used by internet companies to indicate how successful their companies were and to justify their exorbitant stock prices or websites would talk about a metric called stickiness now as investors we need to be very careful when evaluating these metrics because the metrics are defined by the company or by the industry and not by a regulator or not by a standard setting entity companies may present pro forma earnings pro forma earnings are earnings that have not been created according to an accounting standard such as us gap or ifrs as analysts when we are evaluating pro forma earnings we need to be very careful about the assumptions being made because with pro forma earnings 
the company can make any assumptions that it wants in order to present information that makes the company look favorable. Companies may construct their own version of EBITDA. And before going into how this might happen, let's just understand the importance of EBITDA. EBITDA is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Depreciation and amortization is a non-cash charge. So this number is often used as a proxy for operating cash flow. It is not exactly operating cash flow, but in the investment community, it is a popular proxy for operating cash flow. What companies might do is also subtract certain other items. So notice when I say subtract or exclude, in this number, this is simply the net income where certain expenses have been excluded. Which expenses? Those expenses are the interest expense, tax expense, depreciation expense, and amortization. So what a company might say is that they also want to remove rental payments for operating leases. They might say that these rental payments to some extent are like interest payments and then get a higher EBITDA number because these expenses are also being taken out. But remember, this is a non-GAAP activity and needs to be looked at very carefully. A company might say that equity-based compensation is also being taken out. In regular EBITDA, any equity-based compensation is one of the expenses that is included. So when a company is removing an equity-based expense and causing EBITDA to be overstated, that is something that needs to be analyzed very carefully. Acquisition-related charges. So companies might say that acquisition-related charges are just one-off, so they might exclude those charges. Impairment charges for goodwill and other intangible assets. So a company might say that impairment is to some extent like depreciation and amortization. It is one-off, so companies might exclude this expense. Impairment charges for long-lived assets. Again, these are tangible assets, and let's say a tangible asset is written down. A company might say that this is a one-off activity. Litigation costs might also be considered one-off. Loss gain on debt extinguishments these might also be removed from EBITDA. So the point is, anytime a company is excluding items that are not allowed to be excluded under standard accounting principles, you as an analyst need to be careful. Also, when you are comparing the EBITDA numbers for multiple companies, you need to ensure that EBITDA is calculated using the same set of formulas and using the same set of assumptions. IFRS requires a definition and explanation of any non-IFRS measure included in financial reports. So if there is a new version of EBITDA or there is a new version of operating income that is a non-IFRS measure, then IFRS says that those non-IFRS measures need to be very clearly explained in the financial reports. Similarly, US GAAP also says that any time non-GAAP measures are being used, then the closest GAAP measure must also be given and presented with the equal amount of prominence. We now look at how accounting choices and estimates can be used to manage earnings and balance sheet items. When we talk about accounting choices, one choice might be when valuing inventory to use FIFO or to use weighted average cost. When we talk about estimates, the classic estimate has to do with the depreciation amount every period. So the estimate would be how many years of useful life for a particular long-lived asset because that would drive the depreciation amounts. Some of the items that the curriculum highlights are shown right here. Simply by changing shipping terms, earnings numbers can be managed. Let's say that a company is shipping $100,000 worth of goods on the last day of a particular quarter. If the shipping terms are defined as free on board shipping point, what that means is that the sale is made on the day the product is shipped by the seller. So 
if your company is the seller company on the last day with the terms that I just mentioned the revenue can be recognized that is assuming that the other revenue recognition criteria hold such as reasonable assurance that money will be collected and so on but simply by having the free on board shipping terms the revenue and hence the earnings can be booked for this particular quarter let's say that there is another situation the next quarter where earnings and revenue numbers are really good and management wants to push some earnings to the next quarter then what could be done is that shipping terms could be defined as FOB destination this would mean that the sale occurs when the product is received by the customer in other words when the product reaches the customers docks so what we see here is that with something as simple as shipping terms the earnings can be managed quite easily a classic accounting choice is first in first out versus weighted cost and this applies to inventory under IFRS both FIFO and weighted cost are allowed US cap companies also have the option of using last in first out but let's focus our discussion on FIFO versus weighted cost again we'll take a very simple situation let's say that this is the start of a new period and a particular company has inventory this company just sells one item and over the previous quarter the company had built up its inventory the purchase price was one one two two in other words this one product that's being sold initially the first item was bought for one dollar then one dollar then two dollars then two dollars those who have seen my earlier lectures will recognize this sort of example from inventory reading so now this particular period the inventory is being sold and notice that the choice of the inventory costing method impacts the inventory balance and the cost of goods sold say in the quarter two items were sold if the FIFO method is being used then the assumption is that the first two items are being sold so the cost of goods sold would be 1 plus 1 which is 2 and the ending inventory would be 2 and 2 which is 4 so if a company wants to understate COGS and overstate the ending inventory then it would use FIFO on the other hand if the company uses weighted average cost then the weighted average cost here is 1.5 therefore with weighted average cost the COGS is going to be 1.5 into 2 because we are assuming that two items were sold so then COGS is 3 and ending inventory is also 3 so notice that just the choice of FIFO versus COGS can produce different numbers for balance sheet items and for income statement items and this could potentially be used to manage earnings as well as manage or influence the numbers on the balance sheet credit sales here is another scenario let's say that in a given period a company sells products worth hundred thousand on credit and based on past experience let's say that the collection rate is 97 percent and the default rate is then three percent so this three percent needs to be applied as a contra account against receivables which would essentially also be shown as a bad debt expense or a provision for bad debt expense if a company wants to manage its earnings it might make a case that in this particular period the bad debt rate or the default rate is only 2% the company might make a case that the economic situation of the region where our customers are located has improved so the default rate is expected to be lower this is very hard to challenge and many companies actually get away with such reasoning but it is a scenario or an example of how an estimate is being used to manage earnings numbers deferred taxes and this has been seen in the level one reading on income taxes there might be times where a company 
based on possibly some losses or some credits might create a deferred tax asset. A deferred tax asset is a situation where a company will pay less taxes later. So it is a benefit that is expected in the future. Under US GAAP, this is dealt with using valuation allowances. The details have already been covered in the reading on income taxes, but the idea is this. If a company wants to overstate its assets, it might maintain a deferred tax asset on the balance sheet even though the economic outlook is such that a company might not be making profits in the future. If the company is not expected to make profits in the future, then having a deferred tax asset might not help because it's conceivable that the deferred tax asset expires before the company becomes profitable. If that is indeed the case, then it would be inappropriate to have a deferred tax asset on the balance sheet. So as analysts, we need to be careful about checking whether companies are misusing deferred tax assets. The next one is depreciation methods. The curriculum spends a fair amount of time on this. The idea is fairly straightforward. Often companies have choices about which depreciation methods to use. Simplistically, we can say that a company might use a straight line method or an accelerated method such as double declining balance or a method that is based on units of production. Obviously, the depreciation expense over a given period will vary based on the method used. Also, the reported value or the book value of the asset will vary based on the method used. So, what company management might do is select a method that produces the expense numbers or the asset values that suit whatever it is trying to accomplish. These are simply some of the major examples and they should look familiar because they connect with material that you have seen in other parts of financial reporting and analysis. Obviously, there can be several other ways in which companies can manipulate earnings based on the choices they make or the estimates they make. I'll just give you one more example before moving on and that's the example of goodwill. When a company purchases another company and let's say that the acquiring company pays more than the fair value of the net assets, then goodwill is created. Therefore, initially the value of goodwill is fairly objective. But over time, companies are required to periodically test for impairment and this is quite subjective. Given the level of subjectivity, there is a question mark as to when we see a certain goodwill amount on a balance sheet, is that still valid? If a company wants to maintain high goodwill, it can make high estimates about the overall value of the company and then avoid impairing goodwill. If for some reason a company wants to write down assets, write down goodwill, then it might make low estimates for the value of the company. Analysts need to be careful about this. Often what analysts do when they compare companies is to simply compare the tangible assets because of the degree of subjectivity associated with goodwill. Let us now look at how choices made by management can impact the cash flow statement. Recall that the cash flow statement has three parts, CFO, CFF and CFI, cash flow from operations, cash flow from financing and cash flow from investing activities. Generally, investors are most concerned with CFO because this represents the cash flow generated by the core operations of the company. And hence, this becomes the focus of a lot of investment related analysis. Since company management knows that analysts are looking at the CFO, a lot of manipulation that happens with regards to the cash flow statement is focused on the CFO. More specifically, if there is, and more specifically, 
the issue that often shows up is a misclassification of cash flows. For example, a certain cash outflow should really be shown as an operating outflow, but it might be shown as an investing outflow. Another inflow should really classify as a financing inflow, but is shown as an operating inflow. As analysts, we need to be careful about such manipulations. One specific manipulation that is fairly easy to do is payables management. And let's look at a simple scenario. Say we are looking at an indirect version of the cash flow from operations. And if you recall from the reading on cash flow statements, we start with a net income number and then we look at the change in various working capital items in order to come up with CFO. One of those working capital items is accounts payable. Let's say that accounts payable at the start of a given period is 100 and then let's say that the payables amount goes up by 50 so the total payables amount becomes 150 and then before the end of the period the company pays off 60 so the payables amount is down to 90. When we do the reconciliation we look at the payables at the start of the period end of the period notice that accounts payable went down a decrease in a liability such as accounts payable is considered a use of cash which has a negative impact on CFO. If a company wanted to manipulate the CFO number, what it could do is stretch the payable. In other words, rather than paying off 60 before the end of the period, it could just delay that payment, which would mean that the payable's balance would go from 100 to 150. And notice what happens here. With accounts payable going up, the difference or the change is plus 50, which would have a favorable impact on the CFO for the period. You can see that this simple manipulation causes the CFO to be significantly higher. This is called payables management. Another item that analysts need to be careful about is interest capitalization. Let's consider a simple example. Say that in a given period, the actual interest paid is 100,000. Of this 100,000, 70,000 is the expense that we see on the income statement and 30,000 is capitalized interest say the company is constructing a factory and the 30,000 interest payment is based on a loan to construct the factory and is being capitalized. Even though the actual interest paid is 100,000, the amount that might show up on the CFO as an interest payment is 70,000, which means that the cash flow from operations will be understated. This CFO is being shown as an investing outflow and that makes the cash flow from operations look better than what it actually is. Under IFRS, companies have flexibility in the classification of interest and dividends paid and received. Let's consider interest or dividends paid. Under IFRS, this could be classified as either a financing outflow or an operating outflow. In terms of interest or dividends received, these in IFRS could be classified as either investing cash flows or 
operating cash flows. A company that wants to overstate its CFO can play with this flexibility. So for example, the interest paid could be shown as financing so as not to impact the CFO negatively and interest or dividend received might be shown as operating so as to boost the CFO. These are extreme case scenarios but the point to illustrate here is that a company could potentially use this flexibility to impact the number that it shows for cash flow from operations. So what are a few things an analyst can do? To check whether there is any form of payables management taking place or in the reconciliation between net income and CFO given that other working capital accounts are involved such as inventory and accounts receivable, analysts should examine the composition of the operations segment and specifically the working capital accounts. So how are these changing over time? If there are some unusual changes or unusual trends in working capital that might be a warning sign that potentially some manipulation is taking place. Analysts can also compare a company's cash generation with other companies in the industry. Specifically, companies can look at the relationship between net income and CFO, both in the context of a particular company and in comparison with other companies. If a company's net income is going up but CFO is going down, that clearly would be an area to be concerned about. And more specifically, if the general trend in the industry has been that net income and CFO are moving roughly together, then the single company where these two digress would be a major concern. We are now looking at Exhibit 22 from the curriculum. This exhibit highlights questions that we as financial analysts must ask when we are evaluating the financial reporting quality of a company. I'd like you to read through this exhibit. It has been reproduced over here. I'll simply highlight a few items that I feel need explanation. The first one is this concept of channel stuffing which falls under revenue recognition. If you believe that a company is engaging in channel stuffing, that would be a warning sign. This would imply that a company is trying to be too aggressive in recognizing revenue. Channel stuffing is the practice of overloading a distribution channel with more product than it is normally capable of selling. Imagine that you are evaluating a company that manufactures washing machines. This company sells through, let's say, a major retailer. If the washing machine company is pressuring the retailer to purchase more washing machines than can be sold in a particular period, then we might believe that channel stuffing is taking place. To evaluate whether channel stuffing is happening, we can look at whether special discounts are being offered or whether the company is threatening to increase prices in the later period. If channel stuffing does happen, then the risk is that the washing machines being sent to the retailer or being sold to the retailer will not be sold to the end customer. These washing machines will be returned and then that will have a negative impact on earnings in the future. Another item that I'll emphasize is bill and hold transactions. This is where a company bills the customer and recognizes revenue but doesn't ship the product. This would also be an example of very aggressive revenue recognition. Here are some items related to long-lived assets and depreciation policies. The bullet points are self-evident. Next group has to do with intangibles and capitalization policies. Again, this material is self-evident and has been covered in other readings. Allowance for doubtful loans and loan reserves. Companies might not be making the appropriate allowance for doubtful accounts and this can create problems. 
a simple example is that let's say in a given period based on past history the allowance for doubtful account should be 3% but to boost numbers the allowance being used is 2% this would be a cause for concern as analysts we need to understand whether such a change is justified inventory cost methods I want you to read through this tax asset valuation accounts we've talked about this in the reading on income taxes the major point is this when a company reports a deferred tax asset we as analysts need to be aware of whether it is likely that this asset will be realized or not if a company is reporting a large deferred tax asset which expires in three years and during these three years it's unlikely that the company will be profitable then there is a big question as to why this deferred tax asset is being shown I also want to emphasize this last bullet which says the following look for changes in the tax asset valuation account if you recall from the reading on income taxes a company might show a deferred tax asset let's say that the deferred tax asset is 100 and then if this deferred tax asset might not be used we have a concept of a valuation allowance let's say that the valuation allowance is 80 which means that the net effect for the deferred tax asset is 20 the example given here is 100% reserved which would mean that the valuation allowance is actually also 100 then optimism increases whenever an earnings boost is needed by optimism increasing this optimism is in quotes so if you think about it one way to boost net income is to lower the valuation allowance if the valuation allowance goes down from 80 let's say to 70 then the deferred tax asset goes up if we have a lower valuation allowance that is essentially a lower expense and that is positive news for net income so one way to manage net income is through the valuation allowance and this would be difficult to detect so it is a method that companies might use to manage earnings so read through the comment on goodwill this is self-evident warranty reserves read through this this is self-evident also in terms of related party transactions we should look at whether the company is engaged in transactions that disproportionately benefit members of management does one company have control over another company's destiny through supply contracts or other dealings if this is the case then that should raise some additional questions and a financial analyst should probe into exactly what's going on so far we have talked about several ways in which financial statements and financial results can be manipulated broadly speaking when we talk about manipulation we will either have biased revenue recognition or we might have biased expense recognition the next question is what are the different kinds of biases and here again when we talk about biases we could either have a bias in timing or a bias in location a bias in timing would involve either recognizing an expense or recognizing revenue earlier than we should or later than we should bias in location would mean that a particular revenue or a particular expense is not shown where it should be take a particular expense for example this expense could be shown in the income statement as an operating expense or what management might try to do is show this expense as a component of other comprehensive income so this is manipulating the location other examples of manipulating the location happen with the cash flow statement where a particular operating cash 
outflow is shown rather than another example is with the cash flow statement where a particular cash outflow should really go under cash flow from operations but is depicted instead as a cash outflow from investing. What we'll now look at is the set of items that you as an alert financial analyst need to be aware of or that you need to look at to try and detect these major warning signs. The biggest one is revenue. Revenue is the largest item on the income statement and several studies have shown that most manipulation is related to revenue recognition. Therefore, what you should do is examine the accounting policies note for a company's revenue recognition policies. In the disclosures made by a company, there is going to be a segment where the company talks about how it recognizes revenue. So when you read this note, here are the things you need to think about. You need to consider whether the policies that the company is stating make it easier to prematurely recognize revenue, such as recognizing revenue immediately upon shipment of goods, or if a company uses bill and hold arrangements whereby a sale is recognized before goods are actually shipped to the customer. So that's an important item to look at. Does the company use bill and hold or does the company recognize revenue immediately upon shipment? These would be examples of overly aggressive revenue recognition. You need to look at whether any sort of barter transactions exist and how revenue is recognized for them. You need to look at whether there are any rebate programs and if so, do the rebate programs involve any estimates including forecasts of the amount of rebates that will ultimately be incurred. We've talked about this several times but there might be multiple deliverable arrangements of goods and services and you need to look at whether it is clear as to how the revenue will be recognized for these multiple deliverable arrangements. If you feel from the disclosure that the company is getting a lot of flexibility in terms of when to recognize revenue, then that will be a warning sign. Next, it's important for you to look at revenue relationships. And there are several important revenue relationships. A big one is that you should compare a company's revenue growth with its primary competitors or the revenue growth relative to the industry in which this particular company is operating. When you do the equity component of this course, you will study a concept called a peer group, which is the set of companies that are most comparable to the company that you are evaluating. So you need to look at the revenue growth of the peer group on average relative to the revenue group of this particular company. If the company that you are evaluating is showing unusually high revenue growth relative to the peer group, then that will raise some questions. You need to determine whether this unusually high growth is coming because of some strategic advantage, some competitive advantage, superior management. So there needs to be a good explanation, a logical explanation for why this extra growth is taking place. If there is no logical explanation, then that will be a cause for concern and that in of itself will be a potential warning sign. You should also compare the accounts receivable with revenue over several years. There should be a certain stable relationship between the amount of receivables and revenue. If receivables are increasing relative to revenue, then that might raise some questions that might suggest that maybe credit terms are being relaxed. That might also suggest some form of bill and hold practices or even possibly channel staffing. You should look at the receivables turnover, which is sales over average receivables. And then you should also look at the days sales outstanding, which is the number of days in the period divided by the receivables turnover. If there are any unusual changes in these numbers, that would be a warning sign. Also consider the asset turnover. This is the revenue divided by total assets. The asset turnover gives a sense for the efficiency of the assets. If you notice that the asset turnover is coming down, 
that would imply that the usage of the assets is becoming less efficient and that might be a warning sign of potential asset impairment. For many companies, especially in the manufacturing sector, inventories represent a major item on the balance sheet and the cost of inventories or cost of goods sold is one of the largest items on the balance sheet. For such companies, you need to pay careful attention to signals from inventories. There are several things you can look for, but the major ones are shown right here. Look at whether there is any growth in inventories relative to the competition or relative to the peer group. If the company you are evaluating has a rapid growth in inventories, and here again, you really need to be looking at inventories relative to total assets. So if a particular company's inventories are growing at a faster rate than the growth rate for other comparable companies, that will be a cause for concern. Perhaps inventory is becoming obsolete. Perhaps the sales are not as much as they should be. So this is something that needs to be explored. You should also look at the inventory turnover ratio, which is COGS over inventory. If this ratio is declining, that possibly might mean that inventory numbers are rising, which might also be a signal that inventory is becoming obsolete. US GAAP allows companies to use the LIFO method for inventory. This is something that needs to be looked at carefully, especially in an inflationary environment. If we do have an inflationary environment, then you need to look at whether a company is selling inventory that was purchased some time ago. In other words, if we are using last in first out and LIFO liquidation is taking place, that means that low cost inventory is being sold, which makes gross profit margins look unusually good. The next item has to do with capitalization policies and deferred costs. You need to carefully study the company's capitalization policy with regards to long-lived assets and the policy with regards to how costs are deferred. You need to consider how a company capitalizes interest, if at all. And then these policies need to be compared with the competition. If there is a major difference between the policies of the company that you are evaluating relative to the competition, then that should be a cause for concern. Pay attention to the relationship of cash flow and net income. The simplest thing to do here is to look at the ratio of cash generated by operations or CFO divided by net income. On average, this ratio should be roughly one. If this ratio is consistently less than one, then that might be an indication of aggressive accounting whereby net income is shown higher than what it should be. Here are some other warning signs that you should be looking for, something that keeps coming over and over. Evaluate the depreciation method and useful lives. Compare this with the competition. If things are out of line, then that would be a warning sign. Fourth quarter surprises. If a company is operating in a non-seasonal business and in the fourth quarter it is routinely overperforming or underperforming, that would be a cause for concern. Presence of related party transactions. Sometimes with a company where if the founding fathers or the founding family is still heavily involved, there is a potential that this family also has ownership stakes in other companies and in order to possibly manipulate the numbers and have better earnings than and to potentially report biased earnings, there might be some related party transactions. So you as an analyst need to carefully evaluate whether these related party transactions are taking place and what is the intent behind these transactions. Non-operating income or one-time sales included in revenue. One way for a company to boost its revenue is to include non-operating income and one-time sales. So while it is acceptable to have these as part of revenue, but when you do your analysis and when you are concerned about the persistence of revenue and the persistence of earnings, these numbers need to be backed out. 
classification of expenses as non-recurring. This has to do with the location bias. If an expense is classified as non-recurring, then potentially what a company might be trying to do is understate the operating expense. Very often, we as investors are primarily concerned with the operating results of a company. So companies recognize that and might show certain expenses that really should be operating, but a company might classify them as non-operating or non-recurring. Gross operating margins out of line with the competitors or with the industry. This is something we've talked about. If a company looks unusually profitable relative to the peers, then one needs to look at why that's happening. If you are evaluating a young company and this company has an unblemished record of meeting growth projections, that will be a concern because with a young company, possibly in a young industry, one would expect earnings and cash flows to be very volatile. If that is not happening, it might probably be because earnings are being managed. Management has adopted a minimalist approach to disclosure. This would be a major cause for concern. You might suspect that management is trying to hide some information. Management fixation on earnings reports. If management is spending too much time on earnings reports and trying to ensure that analyst expectations are being met, then that would also be a cause for concern. One high-level remark before we go to the conclusion. All the items that we have discussed on this slide and the previous slide are simply warning signs or signals. Simply because you see that the gross margin is out of line doesn't mean that any manipulation or fraud is taking place. What you need to do is look at these signs holistically, look at whether there are multiple issues potentially taking place, and then you really need to dig in deeper to understand why a certain activity is happening. So dig in deeper as to why the operating margin is out of line. And then if you find something wrong, can you conclude that potentially earnings management is taking place? So that is it in terms of this reading. Over the next few slides, I have simply reproduced the summary points from the curriculum. The points here are a recap of the whole reading, and I would like you to read through these points because they capture the essence of the reading very well. This slide deals with the definition of reporting quality and the results quality then the distinction between aggressive accounting and conservative accounting. These are key points and these points are closely aligned with the learning outcomes defined at the start of the reading. This slide deals with the conditions that might lead to earnings management. So do managers have the motivation to manipulate earnings? Are the conditions conducive? So is there an opportunity to manipulate earnings? Is there rationalization? And then you need to understand the mechanisms that discipline financial reporting quality. You need to understand the concept of pro forma earnings and if you do see pro forma earnings you need to scrutinize the numbers extremely carefully and you also need to be particularly careful when you are comparing different companies that might be using their own pro forma statements. You need to be aware of the types of choices that management might have in reporting numbers you need to be aware of the most likely issues and all the major warning signs. So that is it. As always, I want you to practice a lot, go over the examples in the curriculum, and then carefully do all the practice problems at the end of the reading.